Uh, while we get, oh, there it is. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, well, let's have a word of prayer together. Uh, Father, we've just been in your presence as a family in prayer, and uh, I just want to lift my voice up at this moment as well, Lord, uh, just to ask for your anointing and your presence to continue to be with us, Lord, but in a special way as we appeal to your word, as we, we dedicate this time to understanding you better, Father. Just remove distractions, remove obstacles, help us to focus for the next few minutes on what your spirit wants to say to us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I actually want to begin with just a little bit of a family anecdote uh, this morning that was a, a blessing to my wife and I recently. Uh, we got to babysit or dog sit recently for uh, Chaco Cortad, uh, <laughs> the Cortads, uh, and Bailey has fallen in love with Chaco, and he's a, he's like, he's a Chippewa, Chippewa, right? He's a chippet, half rat, half uh, uh, chihuahua. <laughs> he's, he's lovely. He's wonderful. But he came and stayed at our house, and uh, Bailey took over 600 pictures of Chaco for the one weekend that we had him. And this is, I think, picture 532 or so, and Chaco's going, please stop. Please, enough with the pictures. Uh, but uh, we, we enjoyed having him, and Bailey was blessed to be able to pour out a little love into this little Chaco. <laughs> All right, I want to talk about righteousness today, and I want to begin with my kids' quiz talking about different stories involving robes in the Bible. So Toby, yellow Mike, El, uh, Ellie, and uh, Dean Mark, thank you so much. Just raise your hand if you want to help out with the kids' quiz. We want to get it uh, so people can hear it. Um, so we'll start with Julian here. Julian is ready. What color robe did Jesus wear? Purple. All right, Julian says purple. There is many other answers we could have. Eric? Blue. Blue? Okay, blue is interesting. Andre, right back there. And then we'll go to uh, Jacob, and if we see anyone It's either white or brown. I think it's brown. It's either white or brown, and you saw that in the Bible where it says that, right? <laughs> or you're just remembering from something. Jacob, right back there, sir. White. White. Okay. We'll get one more answer, maybe. Right here. White. Another white. Okay, there's going to be some other questions along the way. The most common that you're going to see is Jesus generally wearing white. And the Bible never specifically says he wore white, other than at the transfiguration, it says his clothes began, became as white, you know, began to shine very white, which almost says his clothes weren't white if when he was transfigured, it became white. But um, white would not be very common in that uh, era other than the priests. The priests were specifically told to wear white. But you remember, you live in a dusty environment. Uh, white would very quickly turn to grays and browns. When he was crucified, Matthew says they put on to mock him a scarlet robe. Mark and John say it was more of a purplish hue. And Luke says, I'm just going to call it gorgeous. Notice that these are all men identifying it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It is a fact that men have a less color vocabulary than girls. Guys see a color and they say, it's red. And ladies say, no, it's burgundy, it's mauve, it's uh, maroon, and it's red. I don't get it. It's just a fact, it's probably due to cosmetics and other things, that ladies just tend to see colors with better differentials. So uh, the, the Gospels say to mock the Lord, he was given a robe as well. Pictures will vary. Again, it's not a big deal, but it's just interesting when you think about what Jesus may have looked like when he wore his robe. We know it was a valuable robe because the, the soldiers gambled for it. Remember in the story of the crucifixion? It obviously wasn't rags or worthless, so it was probably very lovely, um, but uh, we don't really know. Who saw God's robe fill the temple? Now, that's quite a robe. Okay, over here, is that Isaiah? Um, B. I said your name, Isaiah. I wasn't giving you any hint. Are you, are you playing me here? All right, we're going to give Julian a chance too. Isaiah. Okay, these young men, have they got it right? 
Do you remember this vision of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6? He sees the temple, he sees the Lord, it's this glorious image, and it says the train of his robe filled the temple, and uh, there's significance to that as well. All right, here's kind of an open question. Do you remember a story in the Bible where someone tore his robes? And there's more than one answer to this. So, and again, we're, we're happy to have any of the young people participate. Who tore their robes? Do you remember anybody? Okay, yeah. Oh, is that Harper? Yeah? Do you remember? Can you say a name or a story? Okay, you keep thinking about it. David and Goliath. Oh, we got one. What, what, what was it? David and Goliath. Can you say it for me, Toby? David and Goliath? Well, I don't know, maybe. Over here. Job. Job. Job is one I often remember, you know, as he's getting all these messages of all, in the beginning chapters of Job, all these bad things happening. Eventually it says Job tore his robes. Okay, Jacob. This one is right back here, Toby. Jacob. Mordecai. Mordecai. That's right. Mordecai did tear his robes. Happens in the Bible quite often, actually. It's very significant. Tearing the robes. It gets in all the papers. It gets put on Facebook. All right, let's just go. Lots of people do. Oh, go ahead, D Dylan. You can go ahead. David. David. He, David does tear his robe. Job does. The high priest, remember when he's in, uh, interrogating Christ, he tears his robe. Paul and Barnabas in the book of Acts, when, when people begin to think that they're gods and they want to start worshiping uh, them, they call them, I think, Zeus and Mercury or something like that. They tear their robe. But Jacob, Joshua, David, Reuben, it's all very significant. It's very symbolic of someone tearing their robes again. Uh, it's not like there was a Walmart in every corner. Clothing was quite valuable. Clothing had significance, so tearing the robes. One that's interesting to me is Reuben, the eldest son of Jacob. When the, when the rest of the sons are selling Joseph off into slavery, uh, Reuben returns to the pit where he thinks Joseph still is, and he recognizes that Joseph is gone, and he tears his robes. Okay? Then they take the torn robes of Joseph to dad, and they put goat's blood on it. Say, hey, dad, Joseph, poor Joseph's dead. And then Jacob tears his, his robe. So there's just torn robes all over the place in the story of Jacob and uh, Joseph being sold into slavery, Reuben. So um, it was a, an interesting thing and very symbolic uh, of someone uh, indicating their grief and their frustration. All right. What do clothes symbolically represent in the Bible? Is it status or rank, spiritual character, family lineage, religious faithfulness? Do any of these ring a bell? All right, right up here. What do you think? You raise your, hey, you raise your hand. B. All right, spiritual character. Anyone else want to answer? All right, Julian up front here. These might not be the most straightforward of questions this Sabbath. A. A, spirit, status, or rank. Yeah, it could be that. All right, one more. Dylan, last one. C. All right, family lineage. There's only one left. All right, let's go, let's go to the young lady right here. Did you want to do it? We've got one over here, too. I want to do it. All right, we're going to let this young man go first. B. Okay, another spiritual character. All right, last one, Anthony. All of the above. Oh, okay. Wrong. <laughs> no, in a way, I, I did try to emphasize symbolically. We do, even today, clothes mean something. What we wear indicates, I mean, people in different cultures wear different clothes. Uh, in different contexts, clothes mean things differently. So it can mean, if you're in the military, what you wear shows your status or rank. Uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, different families might have different ways of showing their heritage and uh, uh, priests, obviously, those uh, in, in ministry in different contexts. But when we're talking about s biblical symbolism, probably the best answer is character. Biblically, when you see in vision or in prophecy an indication or an emphasis on clothing, it is often trying to indicate something about character character, the qualities that define us. Here's, and by the way, uh, Mark and Toby, thank you so much for helping with the mics. That's the end of the kids quiz. Here's the, a, a passage that often emphasizes this in Isaiah 61. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me 
with garments of salvation, right? What does that look like? Is that a white robe, a blue robe? It's the garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness, all right? An indication of God putting His character, His qualities on us. So clothing and robes often represent character. This has kind of been part of a three-part series I started, had to take a delay last week because I was sick. The first Sabbath of the year, I preached on how yours is the kingdom of God and how God teaches the very first words out of the Lord's mouth on the Sermon on the Mount. The very first thing He says in His first seminal uh, sermon that He would give is, blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. It's the very first lesson he teaches. Yes, he does some miracles before that. He does some things before you get to the Sermon on the Mount. But when he begins his ministry, the very first sermon he would preach, the first words out of his mouth is, blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And that lesson is forgotten in the last days, the days in which we live now. Because in Laodicea, the church is no longer considering themselves poor. The church is saying, we're rich. We're, we're doing fine. We have no need of anything. And so we need to remind ourselves of this very basic message of what Jesus taught at the beginning of his ministry, and that's why I have uh, embraced it at the beginning of the year, here in 2023. Let's remind ourselves that our first priority, our first principles should be oriented around seeking the kingdom of God first, not the kingdom of earth, but the kingdom of God. The church needs to be reminded of this. The Bible warns us that in the last days, we are going to lose our, our spiritual eyesight. And we're going to begin to focus the things on earth, and we're going to lose that it's our Father in heaven, and it's the, it's the plan of God in heaven that we are to be embracing here on earth. So that's what I looked at two weeks ago. Today I want to talk about the mind part of this little anecdote. Mine is the righteousness of Christ, and then the last one will be ours is the ministry of the gospel. But for today, I want to talk about the righteousness of Christ. It's so easy. No one ever argues about this righteousness by faith, righteousness of Christ. There's just general widespread agreement about what the righteousness of Christ is. Okay, I'm being sarcastic in case you didn't recognize that. I'm trying to see if there's any recognition on people's faces. Uh, if you're, you know, a lot of jokes begin, a rabbi, a minister, and a, a, a priest walk into a, a bar, you know. This is one of those times. If you were to get a rabbi, a minister, and a priest to try to define what is righteousness by faith, you're going to get very different answers. You could even put Adventists together. Uh, and if you were to ask some of our leading theologians over the years, if you were to take Jack Sequera, if you were to take uh, Maury Vinden, uh, George Knight, and if you were to put them and Doug Batchelor, put them in a room and, ma and make this statement. Say, you must come up with a consensus statement on what righteousness by faith is. I'm not sure they could do it. And this doesn't mean that they're bad guys. This doesn't mean that they're not good quality uh, uh, theologians. But this has been one of the kind of complex issues of Christianity. We even have a few ministers here today. If I was to ask Pastor Phil and Pastor Jean, and we have Pastor Mel here. And where's Jonathan? You have an MDiv, don't you? Yeah, you're extra righteous. If we had Jonathan come up here and we said, ask each of us, Define righteousness by faith. Define the righteousness of Christ. We're probably going to share different answers that are within the boundaries. I'm not trying to say that anyone is going too far, but it is one of those things that is both simple and yet profound. And I'm just going to crack the door open a little bit on the righteousness by faith and the righteousness of Christ today. Now, don't, don't misunderstand this. This is the central message of the Bible. Righteousness by faith is the core of the science of salvation. It was there in Eden. It's there in the law and in the sanctuary service. The prophets talk about it. It's in the Proverbs, Jesus' parables, the epistles. The epitome of the cross of Jesus Christ is there to illustrate righteousness by faith. So it should not come as a surprise with such intense meaning and all the different metaphors in Scripture that at times we're going to look at it from different angles and see different ways of approaching righteousness by faith. And there's all these words, you know, sanctification, glorification, purification, justification, prolapsarian, post-lapsarian. All these things get intermingled in with trying to understand how is it really that Jesus gives us righteousness? And I'm going to make just a couple of basic uh, observations for us today because Jesus invites us to do so. Now, here's that statement that I also looked at two weeks ago. Jesus, later on in the Sermon on the Mount, says, but seek first 
his kingdom. And again, it goes right with his very first statement in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor, or in Matthew's version, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the first priority. If we, get, if we don't get this right, everything else is going to get muddled. Everything else is going to get confused. Our priorities, our principles should be first flowing from heaven and in our, uh, in our advancement and our direction as believers to appreciate the things of God and his kingdom first and foremost. But then Jesus adds this. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Now, and can mean different things. And can be an equivalency. You can sometimes use and to say, here's another synonym for what I'm trying to say. This happens a lot like in the Psalms. You know, God is my refuge and my rock and a shelter in time of storm. Right? These are all equivalents. He's a rock and a shelter and a refuge. It's an equivalency. But and can also be addition. And it begins the first question, is Jesus simply saying that the righteousness that we're to seek is the same thing as seeking his kingdom? Or is he saying there's a second step in this journey that you need to prioritize? First, you're going to seek first my kingdom. And as you're doing that, his righteousness as well. Most Bible translations and most people who study this uh, would suggest that it's an additional thing. Now, I'm going to show you how the New Living Translation uh, translates this passage. These are two of my favorite Bible translations, the New American Standard and the NLT. I have about five or six Bibles that I like to use for different reasons and I compare and contrast, among others. These are two of my five favorite Bible translations. But in this case, I don't like the New Living In this case, I think the New Living made a mistake. They translate it, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. Now, don't don't get me wrong. We should live righteously, amen? We should live right. There's nothing wrong with that sentiment. But that is not a translation. That's an interpretation. That is not what the Greek says. That is the translator saying, we think we know what the Lord is saying here and we're gonna tell the reader uh, what it says rather than translating it. They leave out the uh, pronoun altogether and it changes the meaning too. Are we seeking his righteousness or are we seeking our righteousness? That's not meant to be a trick question. But this is the first stumbling block, and this is the primary stumbling block that I think the church often faces when we are trying to embrace and understand what it means to have the promise and the privilege of the righteousness of Christ covering us. Is that righteousness given to us to help us be saved, or is that righteousness given to us after we've been saved? And there is a world of difference between that. So with all due respect, I love the New Living Translation. Use it. It's very conversational. I like the the language. I think they've erred in this translation. I think it should be kept more basic. We are seeking His kingdom and His righteousness, and we're going to explore that a little bit more. Great controversy. This is a very carefully worded statement. We don't have time to go into all of it. All who have truly repented of sin, turned from sin, and by faith claimed the blood of Christ as their atoning sacrifice, have become partakers of the righteousness of Christ, okay? By faith, accepted the blood of Christ as their sacrifice, have become partakers of the righteousness of Christ, and their characters are found to be in harmony with the law of God. Notice this is very profound. This is very significant. They are not declared to be living righteous. They are found to be in harmony with the law of God. Now, stay with me if you're worried about going too far on this, if you're worried I'm going to go too far on that. But notice as as Mrs. White writes this, their characters are found to be in harmony. Their sins will be blotted out, and they themselves will be accounted worthy of eternal life. This is the work of God on our behalf to produce righteousness in us. And Jesus says that needs to be a high priority in our life. I like the illustration that comes from Zechariah. For for the kingdom of God, I went to the book of Revelation, the end of the New Testament. This is near the end of the Old Testament where we get to see this element of righteousness illustrated. You maybe remember this. This is the vision that Zechariah has of Joshua the high priest, okay? This is how it goes. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, 
standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. This is a judgment scene. This is a vision of final judgment. Joshua, as a representative, as an illustration of those who have been saved, of those who are claiming the righteousness of God, is, is there as a representative of humanity. You have Satan there accusing. He's the adversary, okay? And then you have the angel of the Lord, which is the, in the Old Testament, angel of the Lord is simply the, the reference for the visible manifestation of the invisible God. So you have God there, who, and later he speaks, uh, and, and it says the Lord speaks. So you have God, you have humanity, and you have Satan in the judgment, all right? That's the scene. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Satan is there to accuse. Now, when you get a rebuke, it's because you're out of line and you got to be put back in your place. That's what a rebuke is, isn't it? You're out of line. You are not correct. You have errored and you need a rebuke to put you back in your place. All right? Nobody likes to be rebuked. <laughs> But that's what rebuke means. The Lord rebukes Satan because Satan makes an accusation against Joshua, and God says that is out of line. You are out of line, and I rebuke that. The Lord rebuke you. Indeed, the Lord has chosen Jerusalem, Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? See, Satan is saying, look, the fires of judgment, the fires of damnation are deserved by Joshua. Look at him. He deserves to be eliminated. He deserves death. And God says, you are out of line. He is a brand plucked from the fire. And then it goes on to describe the situation. We don't know this until this moment. Now, Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. So he's wearing the high priestly vestment. Okay, he's not wearing rags. He's wearing the high priestly vestment, but it is it completely defiled. I like how the commentators and different scholars, they spend so much time on this word filthy trying to identify it. It's a unique word. Uh, Isaiah uses a similar word when he says all our righteousness is as filthy rags, which is a very specific reference to, oh man, you know, I guess if Eva can say butts for children's story like five times. Um, which may have been a butt too many. I don't know. <laughs> the specific reference of Isaiah was uh, uh, the filthy garment. Oh, Pastor John, how do I even say it? It, it was a, women, a woman's minstrel rag. That's what it was, a woman's minstrel rag. It is a different word here in, uh, uh, in Zechariah. It probably means human excrement. The, the high priest is not dirty just because he's been working so hard in the priestly and he's got the soot from the fire and he's got the dust from the road. He is beyond ritual, moral, or physical cleanliness. He is a raggedy mess. And we'll find out in just a second, from head to toe, from head to toe. Joshua looks nothing like the elevated and glorious. He is so defiled, he is so wretched that Satan thinks this accusation's man. This is easy. Can't you see? I can't even. He stinks. He is just a mess. And God looks at him and says, I don't see that. I rebuke you. And he said to those who are standing before him, remove the filthy garments. So important, dear church. If you, oh, if you hear nothing else, I, I would implore you to hear this. God does not cover our sins. He removes them. He does not cover our iniquity. He removes them. He covers our shame. He covers our nakedness. He covers our humiliation, yes, but He does not cover our sins. Remove the filthy garments. Don't leave them on Him. Take them away. Again, He said to me, see, I have taken your iniquity away. Again, garments are like character. I have removed them. I'm not covering them. I'm not going to Febreze it and say it's all right. Get it away, and I will clothe you with festal robes, robes of celebration, robes of victory. He goes on to say, then I said, let him put a clean turban on his head. He's filthy from head to toe, even his turban. Any of you who have uh, helped uh, potty train your kids, you realize how they can get filthy from head to toe. That's what Joshua is here. 
filthy, head to toe. So they put a clean turban on and said, clothe them with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord admonished, uh, admonished Joshua saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways, if you'll perform my service, then you'll also govern my house and I'll have charge of my courts and I'll grant you free access among those who are standing here. Very critical principle here. God saves Joshua first. God removes Joshua's sins and iniquity first, then clothes him with the robes of righteousness and celebration and challenges him to walk according to his standards, to serve according to his standards. Salvation comes first. Three quick truths. Salvation always comes first. Even the Exodus story, right? God saves Israel through the Red Sea first and then says, here's my law, then says, here's my sanctuary. But He saves them first. Then comes the challenge to walk in His way. Righteousness does not excuse or cover sin. Righteousness is not a, a, a license to say, now that God has done this for me, I'm no longer accountable to what He teaches and does. Righteousness is freely given and expected to be freely shared. Among all the other elements of what we could learn and appreciate and study, these are three that I want you to come away with. Salvation always comes first. Righteousness does not excuse, and it's given to you for a purpose. Not just for your own internal well-being. I'm so glad I'm righteous today. Woo! Love it! It's given to you to share. A couple of passages. By His doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I like this verse so much because Paul includes this word sanctification. There's all these different theories of salvation and different theories of righteousness by faith over the years, and the idea that justification is the work of God, but sanctification is my work that I do after He's here, Paul says, even, by the way, sanctification, it's just, in English, we don't have a verb form of the word holy. We don't say holification, okay? How do I become holy? Okay, it's the process of sanctification is what makes us holy, okay? And here, Paul says, even your process of becoming holy is because of Jesus, in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Paul says it is the kindness of God that leads us to uh, repentance. We can't even repent without the Holy Spirit taking us by the hand and saying, come with me. It is still the work of Christ on our behalf. This one from Galatians, uh, it gets very uh, easily misunderstood, and I just want to give a shout out and a thank you to Pastor Paul Blake uh, because he's devoted so much to the study of Galatians, and I've benefited from it so much. Here, here Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Now, you look at this in a vacuum, and people get confused very easily. It's not that complex. What Paul is simply saying is a righteous law cannot acquit the guilty. The law is righteous. The law is good. The law sets a standard. And man, all have fallen short and uh, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The law cannot declare us innocent and still be a good law. Do you see what I'm saying? The law cannot declare, it, the law cannot mock the victim and then excuse the victimizer. Then what kind of law would that be? Would that be a holy and just law? That's all this saying is that the law has a standard that we have all fallen beneath, and the law can only accuse us. That's all the law can do. It can only accuse us because we have all fallen short of it. It is therefore only the grace of God that can substitute the guilt of those who have fallen short of it and then raise us into His image and righteousness. That's what Paul, we neither nullify the law nor the grace of God when we accept the righteousness of Christ. Both are still intact. Both are still holy. Both are still part of his character. Paul says the grace of God is not nullified because by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Now, that does not excuse us. And again, simple illustrations sometimes just help with this. And I know you've heard this a hundred times. You're speeding down the road. You know, imagine it. I know you don't do this, but imagine you're speeding down the road. Okay, never, yeah, especially in, in Phoenix, nobody speeds here, okay? Um, 
And, and lo and behold, uh, the lights come on behind you, you get pulled over, and the police officer says, yeah, you're going a little fast, and you know, you've broken the law. And you say, oh, I'm sorry, and you just, you know, you tear up a little, please, <laughs> I just got the wife sick in bed, and I got the kid, you know, you, 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 know, you, you give your story, okay? And the police officer says, you know what, you're, you're, you're a decent person, I, I'm going to give you grace. You're, I'm not going to hold you accountable to the law. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you grace. And you say, really? I don't have to keep the law? Thank you, Mr. Officer. And you peel out and it's 102 down the road. Is that how it works? No, grace doesn't mean that we are no longer... Ba- grace means we're all the more appreciative of the law. Grace means we're all the more appreciative of the God who gives us this standard and says to live and, wa- and, live and walk by it. We, we understand this at, at, at so many levels, and yet when it comes to our walk with God, and, and you say, well, I have other priorities. I don't want to live by the law, and so it's more of our flesh than it is our true understanding of what God calls us to. Grace does not nullify, uh, uh, the, uh, or righteousness does not nullify the grace of God. This I pray, that your love may abound, love which is the fulfillment of the law. Love which is the product of God in our lives. Love which is the resistance of selfishness. That your love may abound still more and more in the real knowledge and discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless. We want to be sincere. We want to be blameless. But notice that he says, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness. The righteousness came first in order for us to be sincere and blameless. Do you see it? Three people saw it. Having been filled. What is been? Is that present tense, future tense? That's past tense. Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. See, the the deception of the devil is... You know what? God does great things for you, and, and you can allow God to be very gracious and kind, you know, for the things that He's done in the past. But now that you know these things, you better get your act in order. You better live righteously, which again, we're not saying anything wrong with living righteously. We should live righteously. But now you're on a path. If you live just righteous enough, maybe God will save you. But that's the complete reverse of the gospel. The gospel is He saves us when we're filthy. He saves us when we're slaves. He saves us when we don't deserve it. He saves us when we're guilty first. And then He sets us on a path of righteousness. But salvation comes first. Through God, through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. God gets all the glory. It's not Dave Lounsbury that gets the glory. God gets the glory because it's through His power and His intervention that His righteousness is worked out in us, that I may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, if anyone sins, we have an advocate. That's the same Greek word as what the Holy Spirit is called, the paraclete, the comforter in the Gospel of John. If anyone sins, we have a comforter. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, which is that courtroom scene that Zechariah illustrated for us with the Lord standing there and looking at the filth of humanity and still saying, I love them and I'm going to save them and I rebuke the accusations you have against them. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. How can I have confidence that the Lord has covered me with His righteousness? What is the acid test? I would share with you three very simple things. I think if you're really seeking the things of of the Lord, you will have peace you will have peace. You will not fear. You will not be overcome with guilt or sorrow. Now, there are times that the Lord needs to use these things to get us to understand what He's doing in our life, but we should not be under constant pressure and constant fear that I just haven't done enough. 
You know, I, I minister to people of all walks and, and life, and one of the, the saddest things I've ever experienced is when I'm really ministering to someone who's elderly and they're nearing death, and I still hear them make comments like, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm good enough. I'm not sure. And, and you think we should not live our entire lives with this lie that that's how God measures us. He saves us because He's promised to save us, because He loves us, because He created us. That is not a license to be evil and bad, and Paul goes into great detail to describe the, the, the crazy way that we sometimes interpret it. So because God saves me even though I'm bad, I can be bad. That's not how it works. When you truly are seeking the Lord and truly asking for that removal of iniquity, repenting of sin, and He clothes us with that robe of righteousness, a peace should be about our lives. We, above all people in the last days, should be filled with peace. The, Lord, the, the world is not going to seek out the church if the church is filled with wrath and sorrow and guilt. They have enough of it out there. Do you have peace that God is on His throne and God has done the necessary work on Calvary for your salvation? Do you wake up with a sense of hallelujah? Praise the Lord. You will have peace. Second, this is part of the daily grind, but as you are accepting the, righteous, the righteousness and pursuing the righteousness of Christ, obedience will cease to be a burden and instead will become a blessing. Now, you can look at obedience in so many different ways, and we can look at the specifics of the Ten Commandments, and, and, but we won't be biting our fingernails for Sabbath to get over. Oh, it's playoff season. <sighs> what time is it? Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with wanting to follow your team and all that but you'll look forward to the blessings of the Sabbath instead of, oh, I guess I can't do this on Sabbath. You'll look forward to the blessings of giving to God. You'll look forward to the blessings of the fellowship of the faith. You'll look forward to having the mercies of God extend from God to you to others. You know, one of the things that is great about God is that it says He delights in mercy. Do you? Do you love to forgive people? It's hard, isn't it? But the more His righteousness comes into you, the more you will find the freedom and beauty of what, it likes to of what it's like to live a life that forgives and doesn't hold on. As God's power flows through you, obedience will not feel like a burden. It'll be a blessing. Come and let us go to the house of the Lord together. Come, let us serve together. Come, let us share of His ministry and gospel to our fellow man. That is my priority. That is what I love to do. You know that that's the case as He works in your life. And this is the same with any relationship. When you love your children, when you love your spouse, it's not a burden to serve them. It's not a burden to cooperate with them. It's a joy. But last, last, equally as important as the, as the first two. How can I have confidence that the Lord has covered me with His righteousness? You know, most of the conversations I have or the books that I read about righteousness by faith and the righteousness of Christ tend to focus on me. Well, if I have the righteousness of Christ, does that mean I don't sin anymore? And what if I do sin? What happens if I have that impure thought? Does that count? Or maybe it's just a little white sin. What kind of sacrifice do I need to make for this sin? Or if I have this sin, if the righteousness of Christ is in my life, what happens if I… It tends to be very self-centered. One of the ways that we know that God is doing a work in our lives and that we are excelling and exceeding beyond the basics is that we cease to look at ourselves and we become more like the character of Job who said, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Or we become more like Moses who when God said, Moses, move out of the way, I'm going to destroy this stiff-necked people. Moses said, no, don't do it. Take my name out of the book, but what about your name? What about your people? Save your people, even if it means you take me out. 
Can you imagine? Or you come like when Jesus spoke to Peter after, after the resurrection, and he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter three times says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And every time Jesus said to Peter, well, then take care of my sheep. It's not about you. Feed my flock. Tend my lambs. You want to know when God's righteousness is really covering you? It's when you don't notice your own righteousness and you don't care about what nuances of measurement are being used. Don't get me wrong here. I know this is being recorded. God cares uh, that we uh, continue to develop in our own spiritual journey. But your focus, your priority will not be on yourself. It'll be, God, what you have done for me, may I share it with others. May I be a minister. May I be someone who can share and not hoard this to myself. Stand firm, Paul says. Stand firm, therefore. Girded your loins with truth. And having put on the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The reason we wear the armor of God and the reason why we have these promises is so that we can be participants in sharing the gospel. Are you confident of God's love today? Are you looking forward to what He's going to do in your life in 2023? Are you seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it is a humbling thought. And this is, again, just a tiny part of the examination and evaluation of the beauty and sublime truth of the science of salvation. But Lord, you give us this instruction. You give us this sermon in each of these moments, in each of these visible ways of understanding your plan. And God, without your grace, without your love, we are clothed in filthy garments. But you remove those from us as we allow you to do that in our lives. And you wrap us up as you would wrap an infant child in your hope, in your glory, and in your righteousness. Father, help us to learn. Help us to grow in this. Help us to be a people that defies the image of the church in Laodicea. Help us to be a people truly seeking your kingdom and your righteousness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.